Hi, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, happy uh, May Day, International uh, Workers' Day. Uh, this is the Canadian Foreign po Policy Hour, and I am Eve Engler, uh, coming to you from uh, Jojage, which has long been a meeting place of, of various uh, First Nations, otherwise known as Montreal. Hope everyone is doing well this evening. Um, there's been many different developments in Canadian foreign policy in recent days, so I'll get right, uh, right to it. Um, a, about a week ago, uh, Juan Guaido uh, made his way to uh, Colombia and then uh, fled to, uh, to the U.S. Uh, during a, um, a, uh, a summit in Colombia over around the issue of Venezuela and, and we establishing ties with Venezuela and is widely viewed as Guaido trying some last ditch effort to to sort of embarrass the Colombian government or draw attention to himself in the context of him having uh, completely failed with his plan to become uh, president. Uh, but then he he left the country, so he he went to um, to Miami. So this seems like now this is really the end of the final stage of the whole uh, four year Juan Guaido uh, uh, experiment initiative, um, which which should be an embarrassment to uh, to the Canadian government. At the conference at the, on Columbia, there was a, a Canadian official represented, uh, I think the person in charge of Latin America for Global Affairs Canada. And part of what they were doing at this conference on Venezuela was discussing sanctions. So, um, uh, and Canada, of course, still has sanctions on Venezuela. Obviously, the U.S. is, is in the lead. There's a whole question of all this money that uh, Guaido's forces have had control over for the past four years, uh, Venezuelan government money. Um, and so uh, that's part of what's being... Uh, uh, sort of negotiated, and they're trying to use that leverage to force the uh, concessions from the uh, from the Maduro government. Um, a couple of days ago, it, uh, there was a report about Canada's trade minister uh, contacting her Mexican counterpart to officially complain about the uh, uh, some changes to the mining legislation taking place in Mexico strengthening uh, rules around water permits, reducing the length of mining concessions from, I think it was from like 50 years down to 15 years, uh, making ensuring that local communities got 10% of the profits. Uh, you know, I, as someone who doesn't know the ins and outs of Mexican mining legislation, it's not clear to me, you know, how significant these reforms being proposed are. They seem on the surface of it fairly significant, and the Canadian government is press pressing the Mexican government to uh, not move forward with them or to water them down. Um, so once again, the Canadian government is, is uh, acting as the you know, ugly Canadian, uh, pressing on behalf of Canadian mining companies, which of course dominate in Mexico and, uh, and is looking out for uh, uh, corporate interests. My guess is the vast majority of Canadians uh, would be sympathetic to the to the uh, mining reforms being pursued by the uh, by the Mexican uh, government uh, tomorrow in Toronto. Anyone who's in Toronto, there is a uh, the uh, Barrick Gold is hosting their uh, annual general meeting, and there is a uh, mining and justice network is organizing a protest at um, uh, Bercy, Bercy Park at nine a.m. tomorrow morning. Uh, they're going to march towards the uh, Barrick Gold uh, uh, Convention. And so anyone who's uh, in Toronto and interested, please do uh, uh, check that out. Um, there's been years of protests against Barrick Gold, which is probably the most egregious uh, Canadian global, uh, has been the biggest Canadian global miner and involved in all kinds of abuses from Tanzania to Papua New Guinea uh, to Chile, uh, etc. In the, in the Globe and Mail... On uh, Saturday, I think it was, there was a uh, op-ed from the author of the book, The Schwinnigan Fox, How Jean Chrétien Defied the Elites and Reshaped Canada. And it was on the 20th anniversary of, of uh, George W. Bush declaring victory in the Iraq War 20 years ago. And in this article, 
the he begins it with saying, quote, Canada would have been fighting with the United States, Britain, Australia, and others, but for one man, the Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. What did he know that others did not? So the full explanation for Canada purportedly not joining the Iraq war was that single man, that great foresighted man of, uh, of Jean Chrétien. Um, well, as we know, uh, as was previously detailed uh, by Richard Sanders uh, a few weeks ago on a session of the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, Canada was in fact involved in Iraq in many different ways. But, but it didn't give the thing the Bush administration wanted above all else, which is the official endorsement of the Coalition of the Willing. Now, that had, I think it did have something to do with Jean Chrétien, but it had more to do with the mass protests, specifically here in Quebec, in Montreal, and the fact that there were elections coming up in Quebec, and the fact that the, the pop popular opinion in Quebec was strongly against the war, even liberal uh, Premier uh, Jean Charest was, was uh, uh, criticizing uh, the U.S.'s uh, plans. And there was a feeling that by Canada joining, officially joining the Coalition of Willing, that that would give a boost to the, to the sovereignist uh, 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 movement in Quebec and the PQ winning, winning those elections. So all of that is just wiped out from the historical record, the popular mobilization, uh, on one hand, and then Canada's actual contribution on on the other hand, and this is you know this is the state of uh, of Canadian uh, uh, commentary. CBC uh, reported that the communication security establishment, which is essentially Canada's NSA, um, that that its watchdog reported um, that the cyber agency with changes the Trudeau government brought in that expanded its mandate. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, that the CSE was was um, indifferent to international law. Its actions were, were basically violating international law. We don't really know the specifics. It's not detailed, but the its watchdog uh, uh, came to that conclusion, which is fairly significant. Uh, the CSE, of course, claimed that there was some misunderstanding, et cetera, et cetera. But um, this, uh, the fact that its watchdog would 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 report that. Uh, is it should be quite uh, quite concerning and and um, I think it you know we know this is the CSE has been given these greater powers to potentially even knock out other countries you know electricity grids and 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 um, and uh, basically operate in a in a uh, aggressive way uh, that those powers were given by the Trudeau government a few years ago we know that we know they've done you know things like that in the past lots of a whole, a whole lot of spying. Uh, but when its watchdog is reporting that it's uh, violating international law, that's um, that's fairly uh, revealing. Um, so I published a piece con kind of contrasting, which was mentioned in the last session, contrasting the left in Canada's position on on the negotiations and, and fueling the proxy war in Ukraine versus the rest of the world's left and specifically Brazilian President uh, uh, Lula da Silva. And, and in that piece, I mentioned Maud Barlow, the former head of the Council of Canadians. And I, I'd kind of come across Maud Barlow being, you know, not, not good on Ukraine, but I, I hadn't really kind of like focused much attention on it. So I went back and actually looked at, at, at what she's been saying. And she is quite frankly, a, a staunch NATO uh, proxy warrior, really pretty, pretty fanatical actually. In, in her position, um, which is, which is I think, uh, very damaging. Uh, of course, the Council of Canadians has a whole lot of uh, cachet among the left. And uh, I was really kind of taken aback by just how aggressive and how engaged she has been on the issue and just completely one-sided, uh, totally uh, pro-NATO uh, uh, perspective um, and it, I think it's it, it, it obviously impacts the left, but it also is reflective of, uh, of where things are at um, uh, still on the left in Canada on, on that issue. Uh, the Ukrainian President Zelensky mentioned, I, I think yesterday or today, uh, that he is, I, I, uh, Jovenos, um, Ivan 
Kachanowski, the University of Ottawa uh, uh, prof, um, pointed out that Zelensky just said they, they could be going to war, could be going on for 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 uh, uh, dozens of years. <laughs> he said this could be going on for dozens of years, um, which is is very uh, obviously very troubling kind of uh, um, kind of uh, prospect. The the whole two percent of NATO GDP that we talked about in the last session, it's just more and more media attention to this. Canada has to reach this this totally arbitrary two percent military spending uh, figure. Just all across the media, all the papers from Le Devoir, the left end, obviously the Globe and Mail, National Post, more and more stories. Uh, just really hyperbolic kind of language about Canada being, you know, a, a cancer on NATO and all kinds of just extreme kind of kind of language. And honestly, if 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 the daycare lobby would have had this level of institutional propaganda apparatus that the, the, the military lobby had, there would have been a national daycare program, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, uh, the, you know, uh, dental care, all the other. It's just unbelievable to see how much the media is just uh, 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 puppets, echoes, these military funded, aligned, um, arms industry funded think tanks, academics who are just constantly uh, pushing this, this, uh, this kind of line of, oh, the world is falling in because Canada is only spending $30, $30 billion on its uh, armed forces. Um, one of the more kind of like egregious examples was the uh, McDonald Laurie Institute a fellow uh, uh, on their site published a piece. I think it was also uh, published in the conversation or some other kind of publication like that, um, titled The Inability to Intervene in Haiti Highlights Canada's International Irrelevance, right? The fact that our military is saying it doesn't want to intervene in Haiti is our international irrelevance. And it's just like, the, the, it's just the, the presumption of what Canada has done in Haiti is, is just like, obviously it's just been all good. In fact, the guy's making an argument for reducing the Canadian military spending, but he's making an argument for not having the capacity to further intervene in Haiti. Uh, uh, just complete denial of, of all of Canada's role in bringing Haiti to the current situation. That's just completely erased uh, from the discussion. And, and the fact that Canada has been so, so deeply involved in Haiti um, is, is just uh, completely uh, ignored. Now, people may have seen, uh, there's, there's a, a bout of, of news from Haiti, specifically around the fact that uh, some uh, communities in port au prince have begun to basically turn to vigilante uh, uh, justice to deal with the gangs that are terrorizing them. And there was, I think, a, I think it was 10 uh, gang members that were killed. Uh, and uh, and basically, they I think they even actually kind of got the, the gang members from the police, and then um, and then uh, basically you know killed them. And there's more and more uh, uh, sort of calls of of basically community resistance to the gangs. You know, it's widely perceived, of course, that the gangs are are tied into the political uh, uh, figures and, and you know, economic elites. Obviously, the idea of turning to sort of vigilante justice is, is, a, is a very, uh, very um, tricky one, uh, but there is a history of that and uh, in Haiti and particularly when understanding that the authorities are often complicit, uh, often wealthy people able to buy themselves out of, uh, uh, you know, any, any uh, criminal charges or whatnot. And, and in this case, a view that the gangs are, are working with the police and authorities. Um, so who knows where that's going to go? Obviously, the, the media has sort of used that, or some of the, the UN and the media have tried to use this to, to sort of re-push re the whole uh, foreign military intervention, which is obviously something that uh, needs, uh, needs to be questioned and, 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 um, and rejected. Um, but, but it is, I think, the, you know, what that this is ha happening is, is real. Obviously there's a whole uh, you know, broader uh, imperial context to it. Uh, ca Canadian uh, naval vessel returned from Operation Caribe, which is a regular exercise, Canadian naval vessels into the Caribbean. 
And, um, and it's just one indication of Canada's power uh, in the Caribbean. There was a story about uh, the Royal Canadian Mint going to produce uh, the Curaçao's uh, currency and the, the bills. And in the story, it says, quote, in the region, the Royal Canadian Mint is a supplier to the Central Bank of the Bahamas, Barbados, Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, Trinidad and Tobago, and Guyana. So they print, the Royal Canadian Mint prints, and has been doing this for like a long, long, long time, the currency for, for a whole bunch of countries in the Caribbean, which is a, a small indication of, of, of Canada's power in the Caribbean, right? The banking, the legislation, banking legislation in the Caribbean was really written by uh, former officials of the Bank of Canada at the post-independence. And they've had huge influence on the, you know, the tax havens in the Caribbean, which so happens have been very beneficial to Canadian banks. Um, but the Canadians have just had all this influence over banking in the Caribbean. And that dates back to the fact that Canadian banks have been major players there since the late 1800s. And that is tied to the trade from the Halifa, uh, from Nova Scotia, the maritime provinces and Newfoundland of cod during the, the colonial, the, the slave period, sending cod to keep people working in slave plantations and Canadian banks making lots of money off of that. And so there's a long history uh, on the banking front and insurance company front in the Caribbean. Uh, but you see that still playing out today with this you know, very small example of, um, of the um, uh, Royal Canadian Mint producing the, uh, the currency uh, for one of the countries and, and many other countries in the, in the Caribbean. Um, one of the parts of Canadian power in the Caribbean, you know, during World War I, they actually tried to take the Caribbean colonies, the former British colonies at the end of World War I, Canada tried to take them as, uh, as Canadian, as compensation for contributing to World War I. During World War II, Canadian soldiers garrisoned Jamaica, Barbados. Uh, there was concern that that you didn't want to remove all of the white troops, uh, the British troops that went to you know, Europe to fight because they were, that, that could open up space for uh, indigenous forces to, to uh, take, take power or revolt or, or whatnot. Um, and um, so they, they played an important role during World War II. Now, uh, two days ago, there's just a huge Twitter uproar about uh, a, a, a tweet that Nora Loretto posted around uh, uh, the world wars. And she said, uh, quote, not a single person who died in Europe died to protect our freedoms or more specifically our right to vote. This is such a juvenile understanding of either world war. And on Twitter, the, the, the militarists and the nationalists just completely lost it. They obviously don't like uh, Nora in general. Um, and they they just completely lost it, uh, attacking her. And you know this was a fight for freedom, and she was basically aligning with the Nazis, and and this is you know all this kind of stuff. Now, it's absolutely straightforward that the, the historical record is you know Jack Granstein, a preeminent military historian, used to be at the official historian of the Department of National Defense, said very clearly Canada went to war in World War II for the same reason we went to World War in World War One, which because the British went to war. And it was when, when the Nazis started, started uh, undermining London's position that it became clear that you know, war was, was necessary from, from Britain's uh, standpoint. As I've written in many places, it doesn't mean I think World War II is the only war that Canada has been involved with, which ultimately was, uh, was for the better uh, in terms of ending uh, uh, Nazism uh, or you know, at least... Hitler and, and Mussolini and um, but but uh, but that, that wasn't the motivation wasn't to fight fascism or to end anti-Semitism or or you know in fact Canada had Mackenzie King the Prime Minister was very sympathetic to Hitler until very late in the game and um, and uh, and Canada enabled fascism and you know it's what it did in Spain and in, in 36 and then also with regards to Japan and providing all kinds of materials for Japan and being you know, fine with what Japan was doing in China and the massacres and the hideous things the, the Japanese fascists were doing. Um, and, uh, and so the, the, this idea that the objective uh, and also that, that how 
the other part to this whole democracy thing that it, World War II was about democracy. Well, Canada brought in um, brought in uh, official official censorship during World War II, banned publications, had like a thousand people looking through the like I think it was like forty five million like letters, like searching through letters, banned books, banned you know all kinds of things that are very hard to argue you know fit within the the realm of like liberal uh, uh, democracy. And also, Canada supported the British Empire, as I mentioned, in, 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 in Jamaica and Barbados during World War II, but also, obviously, in Hong Kong, uh, Canadians, uh, uh, multiple countries in Africa, Ghana, there was missions in Ghana, uh, multiple uh, British colonies in Africa, and then, and, and, and same, same thing in, in, in Asia, and then after World War II, helped, you know, reestablish the British writ in uh, Malaya, later Malaysia, uh, Burma, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, uh, so this idea that the World War II was about some like, you know, fight for democracy or yes, no doubt, uh, uh, getting rid of Hitler, uh, Mussolini, good things. Um, but that's very different than saying that the motivation was some sort of like, uh, you know, democracy uh, 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 struggle. And uh, so, uh, in uh, elsewhere, um, the M23, the the uh, Rwandan-backed forces in eastern Congo. There's a report a couple of days ago. They massacred, it came out 60 people in the North Kivu uh, province uh, towards the, on the border there with uh, Rwanda. Uh, this is just more and more the violence from the M23. That is that is uh, you know this part of a whole three decade long uh, violence. There's a book just published, um, prominent. Uh, uh, Congolese uh, titled the uh, the Holocaust in the Congo. I haven't had a chance to read it in French, um, but it it just this uh, get a sense of what how the Congolese view what Rwanda has been doing in their country over the past thirty years. Millions and millions of people uh, 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 been killed, and and it continues right until today. And yet, a uh, Trudeau about uh, about nine eight or nine days ago, he met with the um, the liberal MP that was just in um, in Kigali uh, quoting Paul Kagame on kindness, the London, Ontario MP, I'm forgetting her name right now, um, uh, quoted her, Kagame on kindness. She was, Trudeau was meeting with, with her and this other uh, uh, Congolese or uh, Rwandan and sort of commemorating the, the, uh, the Rwandan uh, 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 genocide. Now, I don't have the time to get into it, uh, but at, at this point in 2023, this totally superficial description of the Rwanda genocide is really just cover for Paul Kagame and Rwanda for its brutal regime domestically and its ongoing horrors uh, in in uh, in um, eastern uh, uh, Congo. And Canada has been directly complicit in this process in so many different ways going on now uh, uh, 30, 30 uh, uh, years. Um, so Foreign Minister Melanie Jolie uh, flew to Nairobi, as uh, she's currently in Nairobi or was hours ago. And, uh, and this is a reaction to what's going on in Sudan. And, and specifically, it's a reaction to this criticism of the fact that there's a Canadian stranded in, 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 in Sudan. Well, Nairobi is about 3,000 kilometers from Khartoum, okay? So it, it, maybe in the Canadian imagination, it's sort of like right next door, but it, it's actually really far, far away from, from uh, uh, Khartoum. It's not clear to me what Nairobi has to do with Khartoum, um, except for there's been a lot of criticism of the Liberal government for not sort of having enough military assets to get Canadians out from the fighting in Sudan, um, this sort of thing. It, 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 it's even part of the whole 2% military thing has been this, the Sudan thing. If we just had more, bigger military, we could send more uh, military you know, aircraft in to take out Canadians, et cetera. That's you know, part of the rhetoric in, in recent days in the media. So my guess is, is, is as part of just showing we're you know, doing everything we can, Jolie has decided that, that, that going to uh, Nairobi fits that. Uh, so it's a PR exercise. I have to say that the whole discussion around stranded Canadians in Sudan 
makes me quite uncomfortable. And it's, it, 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 this, I, it, well, first part of it is it's just this passport thing. It's this nationalism. If you have that paper, you are viewed as worthy. That's very clear that that's how it plays out in our political culture. You know, at some abstract level, you know, to connect Canada, you know, some CBC reporter that wants to connect what's happening in Sudan to Canadians' lives and wants to interview a Canadian that's there, you know, has a certain degree of logic to it, has a certain humanism to it, but it also has this really intense nationalism that is also very dehumanizing, right? It's also very dehumanizing to those that don't have that piece of paper. And, and so I have to say, you know, like I, I'm not, this is not an argument to leave those who are like, you know, in Khartoum and horrible situation with all kinds of killing around them and just like, oh, well, too bad. That's not, you know, that's, that's can, can be very inhumane too. But I think we need to, we need to think through a lot of some of this sort of how we reinforce uh, uh, nationalist um, uh, rhetoric, nationalist ideology, and and I think even lots of times progressive-minded people uh, end up end up doing that. And and I know I've seen reports from people in in Sudan who are saying that these you know these these uh, uh, cesse de feu the the ceasefires that they are that they are really just pressure from foreign actors on the two different warring factions in Sudan to let the foreigners out of the country. So the whole point of the ceasefire is not really about Sudanese, but about, you know, helping get the foreigners out of the country. And once the foreigners out of the country, okay, you know, you know, go about killing yourself, you know, killing each other kind of kind of dynamic. So so that's uh, that's another side to to uh, uh, to this. But I think at, at its root, there's an element that becomes very um, anti-internationalist. Uh, and, you know, this nationalism uh, that's that's uh, I think we need to you know think um think uh, seriously about. Uh, about 14 days ago, 12 days ago, uh, the Senator, Yu, Senator Wu uh, sent a letter. I, I missed it. I, hadn't, I didn't read it. He sent a letter to uh, Minister uh, Marco Mendicino, I pronounced his name properly, around the whole foreign interference, uh, around the Foreign Influence Transparency Register. It's a reaction to the consultations going on on that. And I had previously said that in, in theory, in principle, I'm, I, I don't have a problem with a foreign sort of registry uh, process, so long as it's applied, you know, uh, universally, and it's not just against, you know, enemy countries or used to, to engender geopolitical conflict. Reading what, what Senator Wu has written, uh, and also a good piece in, um, in the ceasefire.ca uh, uh, blog, I think I think that's wrong. I, I think Senator Wu's position of this doesn't this is just rejection of it is is a better is a better position. Unlikely to to to, to hold uh, uh, politically in the current climate, but that uh, makes uh, I think more uh, sense. Um, and um, in in his letter, um, he talks about this example that, that that's proposed in the in discussion the discussion paper, where of what would a you know foreign uh, malign foreign interference. And basically, the example given by the government is that a, an academic who, um, who meets with a foreign government's representative, and the foreign government's representative suggests that person to write an op-ed and, and on the issue, and then suggests, you know, uh, or then says, you know, bring it up with your students on campus or something like that. And that, and that this academic doesn't disclose that they have a relationship uh, with the foreign government. And that this would be, as the government puts it, quote, this is an example of malign foreign influence because the influence activities are undertaken covertly. Now, a foreign representative meeting with an academic and suggesting an op-ed, now that, you know, suggesting an op-ed is, that can mean many things. Obviously paying for an op-ed is one thing, but just sort of like mentioning, hey, you have these ideas on this issue. Maybe you should submit that to the to the Globe and Mail. That's a whole very different thing. And 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 the idea that that's and that to not have reported that you had some conversation with a, a, a foreign government and they they made some suggestion and and that now you are you know you're covertly uh, you know breaking the rules. 
is what what we're you know breaking the law. Um, that gets into some pretty vague kind of uh, 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 territory that would be, I think, pretty easy, as Senator Wu uh, argues, I think, quite convincingly, uh, to be to be um, uh, abused. Um, so, on this front, in the U.S., there was a the there's an indictment of four members of the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, 10 days ago or something like that. And they're being indicted as, quote, acting as agents of the Russian government within the United States without prior notification. So as I understand it, they're being accused of having worked with the Russian government in some way on, on the, and didn't notify that they didn't, didn't register themselves as the foreign registry that they have in the U.S. In the indictment, as Caitlin Johnson points out in her article on this, she points out that there, the, the four individuals are being accused of, quote, agitprop, and quote, this is in the indictment, writing articles that contained Russian propaganda and disinformation. Uh, now, that is a very uh, hard one to uh, define. As we know, many people think that criticizing Canada's role in promoting NATO expansion is just Russian propaganda. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty uh, uh, a troubling kind of, uh, kind of territory. Uh, at Mount Allison, some students and, and professors have uh, put forward a, a change.org uh, petition that people should sign. It's titled, Mount Allison should not be conferring an honorary degree for Deborah Lyons. Deborah Lyons is the former Canadian ambassador in, uh, in Tel Aviv who organized that infamous pizza party for Canadians fighting in the IDF in early 2020. And uh, um, she definitely shouldn't be getting an honorary doctorate from the university, which is planned for mid-May. So please do sign that. I know they're, they're planning some other actions as well. On the Palestine front, uh, Randall Garrison, the most staunch NDP, uh, uh, anti-Palestinian NDP MP, Vice Chair of the Canada-Israel Interparliamentary Group, he announced that he will not be running again in the, in the next election, which is a very good thing. Um, also, it came to light, I was just uh, told uh, via um, uh, Karen Rodman, that, um, that two of the NDP MPs that were on, listed on the Canada-Israel Interparliamentary Group, that two of them have withdrawn after there was a public letter sent uh, back in uh, August or September of last year, signed by many prominent individuals, and now on the website of the Canada-Israel Interparliamentary Group. Two of those NDP MPs are gone. Obviously, Randall Garrison has not withdrawn. We, we knew he wouldn't do that. Uh, there's still one other NDP MP, Gord Johns, who stayed on, and another NDP, NDP MP who apparently is now on. Um, so it um, looks like there's some uh, positive there, but it's a little bit uh, one step forward, uh, uh, one step back, or two steps forward, one step back. Um, I, pu I published a piece this uh, today or yesterday um, about this uh, flag flap at this uh, the Hebrew Foundation School in uh, a suburb of uh, or uh, arrondissement of, uh, of Montreal. Um, uh, a young, apparently, reportedly a 16-year-old Arab Palestinian looking teenager took five flags that were on outside of this school uh, on their fence, uh, took them down, uh, videoed himself doing that and then burning them later on. And it led to a huge kerfuffle, tons of media attention here in Montreal, uh, internationally, uh, Canadian Jewish News, uh, elsewhere. Um, and uh, and basically it was labeled as this hate hate incident. Even uh, Samir Zuberi, the, the MP, the Liberal MP in that riding, who I <laughs> who I was on the Concordia Student Union Executive uh, with, who you know obviously the Netanyahu protest back twenty years ago, uh, Zuberi was involved in that. Uh, he condemned this this act. It was supposedly an act of anti-Semitism. Um, now, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, you're allowed to desecrate flags. Uh, that's not that's protected. Uh, burning. I, I, I don't know about the legalities of you know, municipal bylaws around burning. Uh, obviously, taking flags uh, that, you, that are not yours would be theft. These are probably cost a dollar or two. Uh, I was at the Israel, that was, it was on Israel Day 
last Wednesday, uh, there was a big rally in downtown Montreal at the same time the school was doing their uh, celebration. And I should point out the school announced on their Facebook that they did this presentation. They did a rally all around the, the neighborhood with the cars with Israeli flags and all this uh, food, Israeli flag, like cake and whatever, whatever. Um, so very, you know, from a from a Palestinian perspective in the neighborhood, very provocative. Somebody who, you know, against apartheid, very provocative, very hurtful. Um, but it's only it's only hate when it's, uh, you know, burning Israeli flag is supposed to be hurtful to Canadian Jews. But, you know, going around the neighborhood and flying Israeli flags in the face of those who've been dispossessed uh, by that country, that's not, you know, that's not uh, hurtful. That's not provocative. Um, now, the story I did looks at the school and, and the school is just, you know, I just went through some Facebook and Insta Instagram posts from the school and they have emblems of the IDF. They have photos of the you know, Israeli soldier. They have talk about hearing from an Israeli soldier in the Yom, Yom Kippur War. And they, they just sing you know, Israeli flags all over, JNF maps with, that include occupied West Bank as part of Israel. Uh, I mean, this is, this is, this is indoctrinating. These are, these are kindergarten, kindergarten. You see, you see kindergarten, five and six-year-olds that are flying Israeli flags. They're indoctrinating them in, right at the start and this, you know, pro uh, pro apartheid European settler colonial uh, uh, ideology. It's really, quite frankly, it's 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 disgusting. Uh, yet we're supposed to be outraged about about a sixteen year old um, Arab kid uh, uh, burning some Israeli uh, flags. Uh, sorry, I think what the sixteen year old did uh, is uh, is on this is on the side of justice a whole lot more than those who are putting up Israeli flags on the outside of the fence of the school. Um, so the hypocrisy is pretty intense. Now, uh, Karen Rodman point, I, I, did, I published this piece about it and I just, you know, private schools in Quebec are subsidized by the government. And apparently it varies each school, of course, but around half of the funding comes from the public. And I put that in my initial version of the article I published and uh, and Karen went to the actual, their, found their, what their, their registry with the, charity stuff. And the school says they got $1.3 million in public funds directly from the government, as well as about a half a million dollars in, in uh, donations, and they're a registered charity. So those would be, you know, depending on the tax bracket, 40%, 50%, who knows, you know, of, of those would be basically a subsidy from the taxpayer. Uh, and then they get other donations that from other registered charities that would also, of course, uh, their donations would be subsidized. So we're, I think realistically you're talking about $2 million a year the school is getting in, in, in public uh, uh, funds. And, and there's not all of the, I did, I did a thing uh, at one point, they saw a thing about how many Jewish schools there are in Montreal. Um, it was like 15. Not all of them are as staunchly uh, Zionist as, as this one, but a, a lot of them are, uh, a whole number of them are. And, I, and at the Israel rally, um, a big chunk of the people who are at this rally are kids that are bused in. There's school buses that come in and bring hundreds of kids to this Israel rally. I was at that uh, at the rally downtown, um, and uh, so so it got me kind of like 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 thinking in the, the, at the macro level how much public money goes into supporting registered charities. Uh, that fund money to send money to Israel. Now, I used to say that it was around a quarter billion dollars that was raised a year. What I've seen with time, that, that's, a, that's a low number. I think it could be as high as half a billion dollars that is being raised annually from registered charities for projects that are you know, money funneled to, for, to Israel. All kinds of different projects, some of them on the, you know, supporting hospitals, things like that, that you can, you know, debate different questions, but, you know, not particularly, you know, egregious politically kind of things. And some of them are really egregious, supporting the IDF, uh, you know, settlement expansion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but then when you start looking at this, of how much money also goes into, public funds go into supporting the Israel lobby in Canada. Obviously, the school that's like indoctrinating these young kids in, in pro-apartheid uh, uh, outlook they are, you know, building the next generation of people going to be speaking on behalf of fundraising for voting for politicians that are pro-Israel or anti-Palestinian. Okay, 
So, so the schools, if you look at how much, you know, much money goes to the school, but then you go look at like the, the federations, the Jewish federations that have uh, uh, raised, I mean, it's like a billion dollars in assets they have. And it's like a couple hundred million, around 200 million, I don't know exact number, around 200 million a year. Uh, you know, look at, you know, Friends of Simon Weisenthal Center, you look at B'nai B'rith, their budgets, th th these are usually, they're all, almost all registered charities, whole bunch of, even the Honest Report in Canada, registered charity, registered charity. So you're talking about like, maybe as much as a half a billion dollars of, of funds by registered charities being sent to Israel. But you're also talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars by uh, registered charities or, or different forms of public funds uh, uh, going to groups that make up the Israel lobby that are campaigning for anti-Palestinian positions uh, 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 here in Canada. So we're, this is the, the amount of money we're talking about, uh, public money even, that goes into this is, is, is quite, uh, uh, quite uh, 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 remarkable. Um, at the Israel rally uh, downtown, I, you can see it on my uh, Twitter. I'm not going to show the videos, but I wanted to show one of them, but I'm not going to, because I'm running a little low on time here. I, 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 uh, I asked the head of B'nai B'rith, if, if B'nai B'rith or B'nai of Quebec, if B'nai B'rith was a hate organization. Then I asked him if Israel's committed the crime of apartheid. Then I asked him if he wanted to apologize to Palestinians. It's a, uh, his, his rhetoric's kind of interesting. I also bumped into... Uh, uh, a Pupko, the the uh, the individual, the rabbi that uh, beat me, that had attacked me when I interrupted Hillel Noor uh, five months ago, and I I, uh, I asked him if Israel has committed the crime of apartheid and whether uh, Israel's defenders turned to violence uh, uh, to defend uh, to defend Israeli apartheid. You can see that he sort of laughs at it. Um, I got that on on video, but I also I also uh, interviewed these. Uh, these Iranian uh, uh, activists who were there with images of the crown, so-called crown prince of Iran, pa Pahlavi Reza, who just traveled to Israel, and they were there at this at the Israel rally to like show their support for Israel as part of this the crown, the Iranian crown prince, the former Shah's son, uh, you know, trying to overthrow the Iranian government. Or um, uh, and I taught interviewed them, asked them if they have any problem with assassinating, Israel assassinating Iranian scientists. Well, no, 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 no problem there, no problem. Um, so it just gives you some, some a little sign of the, the politics. Now, obviously, this, this is not a position that has any support in Iran. This is just, uh, you know, clearly, totally outside. The crown, so-called crown prince spoke at an event with, he met with Pierre Poliev, uh, Melissa Lantzman, uh, about a month ago or something like that in Toronto, spoke at this event. I think Rob Oliphant, the Liberal MP, was spoke at it as well. Um, but this is just speaks to who we're, who we're aligning with in our bid to oust the, the Iranian government. And Canada brought in another round of sanctions against Iran uh, two days ago. Uh, in other news, I wanted to touch on um, uh, Garda, Montreal-based uh, Private, biggest private security company in the world, 120,000 global employees. Uh, seven of their employees in Libya were, were detained by um, I think the government in uh, West uh, uh, Libya. And, uh, and Garda's role in Libya is totally fascinating, got not even close to enough attention. They assisted the rebels fighting Gaddafi. They reported on, on their own website, that they were in Libya in summer of 2011. That's a couple months before Gaddafi was killed. The UN Security Council resolutions were absolutely explicit. No foreign mercenaries on the ground. The reason why they were so the language was so strong is because there was an accusation that Gaddafi was turning to African mercenaries to help his government, but they were absolutely unequivocal in the UN resolutions. I reported on that, and then uh, 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 it got taken down from Garda's website. They no longer boasted that they were on the ground in, in Libya in summer of 2011. They became the biggest player in Libya. At one point, I know they had at least 3,500 employees in Libya. Um, and, and this is just one example. I mean, you know, they, Garda really got big success in Iraq with the American invasion of Iraq, and then in Afghanistan, huge operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. In 2014, Canadian Business Magazine uh, referred to Garda's work as what they did is, quote, renting out bands of armed men to protect clients working in some of the Earth's most dangerous outposts. Um, so this is a, you know, 
this important part of, of Canadian, uh, you know, Canada's role in the world, uh, this that I think uh, falls under the radar, uh, Garter, Garter world. Uh, and they have, um, they get funding from investments from uh, the Caisse des Depots, the pension fund here in Quebec. Uh, the top politicians, former ministers, came ministers on their board and, uh, and, uh, and whatnot. So they have all kinds of political support as well. Uh, on Friday, uh, the Liberal, at the Liberal Convention in Ottawa, they have announced that Hillary Clinton, exciting, exciting stuff, Hillary Clinton will have a fireside chat with uh, uh, Christian Freeland. As the announcement put out time and again, Hillary Clinton has been a global leader on human rights, strengthening the middle class, and building an economy that works for everyone. We're excited to announce that she'll be joining Christopher Freeland for a keynote conversation at Liberal 2023. Well, Hillary Clinton, of course, infamously, uh, when watching the video of, uh, of Gaddafi being uh, killed, uh, brutally, brutally mutilated, with, I shouldn't point out, Canadian fighter jets in the sky, uh, assisting. She said, we came, we saw, he died, boasting about uh, killing Gaddafi. Uh, five years after Libya, she was quoting, quoted saying she had no regrets, despite the chaos that's ensued in, in Libya. Christ uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, she's the one who put Michel Martelly in office, made him, pro made him president. This is the, the PHTK, the 12, 13 years now of, of dissent in Haiti. You know, Clinton's intervention to make Martelly president is right at the core, right at the center of that. Uh, and then obviously with making her husband in charge of the reconstruction, and all the, the, the money disappearing uh, on, that, on that front after the terrible 2010 earthquake in Haiti. Hillary Clinton also, of course, voted to support Iraq, voted the uh, uh, you know, Iraq vote when she was a senator. Uh, I mean, this is, this, is, this is just, you know, standing up for human rights. Obviously, Christian Freeland also has her whole, her, her whole own record. But this, it makes a mockery of all these, these liberals attacking critics of Canadian policy in on the NATO proxy war, when they're you know international law and this and that, and then they are all you know supportive of, of Hillary Clinton, uh, framing Hillary Clinton as this great human rights crusader. Uh, the hypocrisy of it all is really really hard uh, uh, to stomach. Um, and uh, I, I got, I know people, people have been in touch about, is there going to be a protest in Ottawa? It's obviously last minute. I, I don't know if there is. Hopefully there's at least a small little protest. It'd be wonderful if there's somebody inside <laughs> that protested. Um, but uh, it's just, uh, it's too much to see this sort of glorification of, of, um, of uh, somebody like uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, if anyone has any questions or comments, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, open it up to uh, questions and comments. I'm seeing some weird. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, if people, I, I'm having some difficulty finding either Laura, who's been helping with the uh, background, um, and uh, and if anyone has any hands up, I can't see any hands up. So I've I've, I've enabled the unmuting. So if anybody has a question, just go ahead. 
Eva, I have a question, and I don't know if you know this, but Alton, we couldn't put our videos on this time. Uh, maybe there was a reason for that, and I'm not oh. sure why we were all muted. Um, but anyway, I just wanted you to know that. I have a question about, um, given all of the foreign reserves of countries like Venezuela, Russia, and so many places, both governmental and also individual bank accounts where the money has just been seized or uh, frozen, I was wondering if Canada has been doing this as well with these go any governmental reserves from countries they don't like that have been in, in Canadian banks. Is that something Canada is doing? I haven't heard that about Venezuela. I looked a bit about that. I didn't see that with Venezuela. I don't know if that's, there's no assets in Canada. Mm -hmm. With Libya, they did that a lot. They, they, uh, they froze multiple billions of dollars in 2011, and then they gave the money over to the uh, the NTC, the whatever the National Transition Council, the you know rebels that we were backing. Uh, and then they even actually they even uh, they sold drones. Ottawa company sold drones to the rebels with the with, like the Gaddafi government's money uh, um, was um, used for that to pay for that. Um, they have frozen, they've frozen assets of Russia, of course, recently, uh, and and um, and uh, um, Christian Friedland has led the um, the charge on um, uh, sort of officialize like handing them over to U the Ukrainian government. She's been pushing that. There's been a push among um, uh, different uh, uh, you know NATO countries for that, and. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so she's, uh, um, Canada's done that. There's, it does seem like the, the NDP um, sort of criticizes the government for not uh, following through on the sanctions and sort of like the, um, they're not as, as effective in enforcing them as they would want. Um, it does seem that there's some degree of like sort of, I don't know. Um, um, uh, sorry, Josh was in here. Uh, um, there, there's some degree of uh, of uh, ineffectiveness, I guess would put it, in terms of like getting all the assets, the the the, the amount of the dollar sums that have been uh, mentioned, reported on with regards to Russia, are much uh, much lower then uh, one would think that there would be uh, assets to be to be had. But um, yeah, in the case of Libya, for sure, in the case of Russia, for sure, um, you know, like the, the sanctions on the on um, some Haitian officials that I brought about, it's not like the one the one guy had a big house, the big controversy around his house here in, in the Hello. The, the Summer was a comment and, and ask could, a question. Could everybody oh. mute and then we'll unmute you and uh I, I can't I can't see any I can't yeah. see, see yeah. anything. Joan, Joan is next, yeah. Okay. Okay. But, yeah, so just just to, just to finish up, so yeah, they, they there have been assets uh frozen. Um, but uh yeah, there's it's a certain degree of unclearness of exactly how much and Okay, Joan, uh, okay. you're okay. on. I, yes, I just wanted to uh, have a, make a comment about the mining in Mexico. In 2008, I was in Guanajuato, which is a World Heritage Site. And in that site, there are 10 mines that are destroying the water system. Eight out of the 10 are Canadian. Yeah, I'm sure this doesn't surprise you. And the question I wanted to ask is, years ago, I was concerned about the Fraser Institute having charitable status. They even had the nerve to say that one of their objectives is the environment. And I was arguing, well, surely, surely you can't say it's, a, it's when they're undermining the environment. I was at a conference where they had climate change deniers and so on that they say that their objective is the environment if they're undermining the environment. So I'm wondering about, uh, of course, I didn't get anywhere with it. And the same thing with the military. But I'm wondering, and I also suggested years ago that we lobby to end 
charitable status. Is it, is the, I mean, I know some, some groups, good groups benefit from it, but often a lot of groups, a lot of NGOs and are, uh, are, are um, too cautious because they don't want to, they don't want to lose their charitable status. So they, they don't, they're not bold enough. And, and I'm just wondering, but, and also, I mean, as you were pointing out, is uh, there's so much money goes from charitable status to Israel and Israel and so forth. Yeah, I, I, th I agree. I basically don't think the charitable status, it, it, the charitable status skews towards people who have more money. I mean, by definition, if you are in a higher tax bracket and you give a donation, you, you, you know, you get bigger benefits. Uh, also, when you start looking at these private foundations, right, and it, it, there's just a whole huge amounts of money that's different families, uh, wealthy Canadians put in these private foundations and and they basically enable themselves to not pay tax um and then they have all this power right because because when you're when you got tons of money you don't you know you don't the money is not to like you know pay to like live in your house or to eat the money becomes a question of power and so and so having a private foundation that that you get to funnel money to to the political projects that you want to support the ideologies that you want, um, you know that's that's uh, that's really what what else like the, after a certain amount of money, it's not a, it doesn't have any practical use in that sense. It just has a a power utility, and so the private foundations and able to get even the rich people have even more power because they get to avoid paying a whole bunch of tax uh, on the on the basis that they're you know doing some benevolent endeavor by supporting the ideologies that they like. Um, so, so, uh, no, I think the whole, uh, model of, uh, charitable status should, should just be basically eliminated. Uh, and, um, uh, yeah. Okay. So Eve B. Sandhu is next. Go ahead. Hi, it's, uh, Bhagwan Sandhu. Uh, Eve, I think you kind of, uh, uh, went real fast on Sudan. And uh, it's I, it's really something maybe in next week or something, something we need a deep dive because there's a pretty massive geopolitical context in that. And uh, Norway, for the last little while, actually has been attempting to put together with the help of UK and uh, US. So that it's a three party to set up a what they're calling the framework agreement to transition into so-called civilian rule, except it's a sort of a particular type of civilian rule they want because likelihood is, is that the religious groups will take over if they're sort of like an Iran situation, right? And furthermore, the two generals, uh, the Gallo and al Barhan, uh, they were actually, because the timing is also important, like why did they start fighting now? Is that they were actually busy in uh, Yemen. So they were doing the dirty work of uh, Saudi Arabia and now they've come home and, uh, you know, it's uh, things are starting to look that, you know, something's going to happen and, you know, there's a sort of a struggle. Um, so that's one angle that I think uh, I, I would love to hear once you've kind of looked at the situation from that perspective. And the second one is also, and I think it's very important that we almost overlook it all the time, is when it comes to evacuations, Canada's response is not universal either. It's not based on principle. I think to a large extent is based on domestic uh, agenda. So if you look at how we responded to uh, evacuation in uh, Afghanistan, Sudan, versus let's say Libya in 2006, oh sorry, uh, Lebanon, Israel, Lebanon in 2006. The Lebanon 2006, it was uh, $94 million. You know, the uh, government hired ships and chartered airplanes lifted within less than two weeks, 15,000. Lebanese Canadians and Jewish Canadians out of uh, the region. Uh, our response to in Ukraine, when there's, I mean, this is a full blown war in Ukraine. It's not just two parties having three day peace, uh, ceasefires and so forth. So I think there's a, uh, there's two particular angles that um, I've been doing some just kind of our own investigation and research, but I, I think it'd be, I'd be interested to hear your perspectives on those if, if you know, if you have time to look into them, but I think they're very critical. And and Melanie Jolie's uh, 
this sort of performance of going to Nairobi and all the rest. And for the longest time, she just kept saying that, oh, well, you know, it took us by surprise. It actually did not take us by surprise. The uh, uh, Norwegian uh, foreign minister was in Canada on May 9th and 10th. And what was the main item of discussion? It could have easily been, uh, sorry, in March 9th and 10th. It could have been easily about Sudan because Norway is deeply involved in Sudan, except it was all about supporting Ukraine. So it's around priorities and policies and the political calculations that these people are making. So I think, anyway, those are my... No, no, I, I totally agree with you. I think there's obviously like racism elements to it. There's geopolitical elements to it. There's, you know, to how the, the response. I, I, I agree with that. I just, I, 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 I uh, to me, you know, there's a sort of non-internationalist element to the framing of, of, you know, concern about Canadians who are there versus concern for, for, all Sudanese. Um, so, so uh, no, that- fair enough. But what I'm saying to you is, is that there isn't a, there's not even a concern for Canadians per se. Yeah, yeah. There's different, yeah, forces driving that. I agree. I agree. So if that's the end of the questions. Nobody else has their hand up. Okay. So uh, yeah, and and uh, um, it's it's past uh, it's past seven. So. Uh, Thanks everyone. Um, uh, same place, uh, same time uh, next week. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Thanks. See ya.